This is for Computer Science 9618 Cambridge A level, looking at section 14.1, which is protocols. So internet and protocols. Now we often use the internet without a second thought, downloading files from various sources or uploading various files to various sources. But for these data transmissions, there are a set of protocols that have to be followed. And when we say a protocol, we're talking about a set of rules for data transmission, which are agreed by the sender and the receiver. There is more than one set of protocols, and it all depends on the communication type being used that determines what protocol will be used, and we'll be talking about those today. Now, there is a protocol suite that contains a collection of related protocols that is more widely used than any other at this current time. It's known as the TCP IP protocol suite that is made strictly for internet usage. It stands for the Transmission Control Protocol and Internet Protocol, and that is the most widely used one at this time, more than any other protocol. So let's talk about the Transmission Control Protocol, the Internet Protocol, and the stack. So it has four steps involved in transmitting data, and we call it the stack, or the TCP IP stack, or four layers of the TCP IP. Now we're gonna start with the application layer, which is the fourth step, and we'll talk about why in just a few moments. This is the application layer. This is your HTTP, your SMTP, your DNS, your FTP, your POP3. We're gonna talk about all of those in detail towards the end. The application layer encodes the data the file that is going to be sent. That's what it does, it encodes the data. Then we move to the transport layer. This is the TCP, UDP, and the SCTP. The transport layer splits the data, the file that has been encoded, into manageable chunks and adds port number information. Followed by the network layer. This is the IP protocol. It adds IP addressing, stating where the data is from and where it's going. And finally, the link layer, which adds the media access control address, also known as the MAC address information, to, spe to specify which hardware device the message came from and which hardware device the data is going to. Now, the above order with the numbers going down, four to one, is for sending data. Working from the bottom up is for receiving data data. When you're receiving data, you go one, two, three, four. When you're sending data, it goes four, three, two, one. And we'll talk more about that in class. So the application layer, applications and processes that use the network. Three is our transport layer, provides end-to-end -end data delivery services, followed by the inter internet layer, and then the network layer. Okay, so the first step, application. Sending, so it starts with the application layer. We're talking about sending data here. So we're going to start with the application layer and make sure the data is in a format that the recipient will understand. The application formats the data to be sent in a standard way that is used by the application. Now, when we talk about the application, we're talking about hypertext transfer protocol, file transfer protocol, simple mail, simple mail transfer protocol, a post office protocol. And we'll talk about more of those in depth towards the end. Now, imagine we want to send the following list of go Gospels, Matt, Mark, Lucas, and Jonathan. The computer formats the four names into data that the receiver will recognize. The application will wrap these in what is called an XML tag, which is, stands for Extended Markup Language. And it's used to create flexible formats to use and share through the internet or networks. So if you want to share, um, Data, you need to wrap it in an XML tag because it creates a flexible format that can be used through internet or networks. After we have the application layer, we're still talking about sending data, we move to the transport layer. So after the data, data is formatted by the previous layer, which is the application layer, the transport's gonna split it into multiple packets. And these packets are the manageable chunks. So when we talk about the transport layer, putting it into manageable chunks, we call those packets. So think of packets as an envelope that is filled with ones and zeros, which is part of the file. Each packet has a number which specifies that packet's order. 
The number attached to each packet allows the user to put it back together when it receives all the packets on the other end. So it's getting all these packets and they may not arrive in the order and that's okay because they, they're all numbered. The computer will put them in the right order for you. They don't have to be set in order, which is what we just said. In addition to each number a packet receives, it also receives a port number, which is dependent upon the application being used. So we had uh, Matt, Mark, Lucas, and Jonathan. So here we can see there are four uh, chunks here, four packets, and they're all using port 60. So we're going to talk more about that in depth. So here we go. We have a socket, which is an IP address and a port, and we can see there are various port numbers for the protocol, the application that uses it. For example, when you are visiting a website, you're using the hypertext transfer protocol application, which uses port 8080 and 8080. When you are receiving email, you use the post office protocol version three that uses port 110. You have the do multiplayer game, which uses the port number 666 because it's uh, doom, you take it on demons. And then you have the Minecraft, which uses 2556. Five. So go, you're going to get the IP address and a port. And when you combine an IP address with a port, we call it a socket. So we have the port number, which is going to be attached to where it is going. That is along with the packet. After that, we reach the network internet. Now we're sending data and it's almost to the receiver. There's one more step after this though. Now the network layer attaches the IP address of the sender. So the receiver will know who sent the data. The receiver needs to know the IP address of who sent the data. This allows them to send the original sender confirmation message saying, hey, the data has been sent. You don't need to keep sending it. I have received the entire file. So imagine we have the following information. We have the sender IP address and we have a IP uh, 4 version 4 address and we have the receiver IP address. So what is the port being used? Well looking over here we can see that it's going to be port 60. We have the sender IP address, we have the receiver IP address and the network header. In the transport header we actually have the packet numbers along with the port. So before the fourth step, the link one uh, comes in, we need to know what a MAC address is. MAC stands for Media Access Control. Now, it's a unique identifier assigned to network connections embedded into every network interface card during production. This includes both hardware connections and wireless connections such as Ethernet and Wi-Fi. So what we're going to do in class is actually find our MAC address and each one is globally unique. There is not two devices that had the same MAC address. They're globally unique. So the link step knows which piece of hardware the data needs to be sent to. And this is why everyone is unique. The link step is not looking for an IP address. It's looking for a MAC address so it can be sent to the right hardware device. Consoles, cell phones, laptops, desktops. If it can connect to a network, if it can connect to the internet, it has a MAC address. So then, now that we know what a MAC address is, we can actually do step four. So it attaches the MAC address of the sender and the receiver. So we have the IP address, but we also have the actual hardware device because each hardware device has a MAC address. We call that part of the link um, step. Now this allows the packets to be erected to a specific network interface on the IP address host machine. All that means is we're sending it to a piece of hardware. So the sender is using a wireless card and sending it to an ethernet uh, connection. So the hexadecimal address that we have there is the wireless connection. The info was given by the website and that's how we know that. And it's just a sample. We didn't just, you know, you're not going to be able to find this, you know, right away. We're using this as simple review. So let's say, or as a simple, a sample example here. So let's take a look at these review questions. We'll pause here and go over them. Uh, looking at this information that we are given, how many packets are here? What port is being used? What are the numbers in the link header representing? Why is each piece of data wrapped into an XML tag? And why is the file broken into four pieces of data? So let's pause here and answer these questions. 
All right, uh, number one, how many packets are here? There are four packets. Packet one of four, two of four, three of four, and four of four. They don't have to be sent in order, but because they're each numbered, we can put them back in order. What port is being used? And that is port 60 that is being used on both ends of the uh, sender and receiver. What are the numbers in the link header representing? Looking over here, we have hexadecimal addresses. It's given in hexadecimal. I know that because we see some letters like 5D, 4F. And what that represents is the MAC address. So that's what it is, the media access control of the sender and the receiver. Why is each piece of data wrapped into an XML tag? And if we go back, we can look at one of the very first things we talked about. Uh, it's in here somewhere. We talked about it. We said that it stands for extended markup language. I passed it again. And we said it's, it's, it's for reckon, having a format that is easy to work with across networks. And it's right here. XML is used to create flexible formats to use and share through internet or networks. So why is it wrapped in an XML tag? Because it's a flexible format that can be used across networks in the internet. And why is the file broken into four pieces of data? Because it's done into manageable chunks, which we call packets and each one can be sent and that way if one packet fails we just need to resend that one packet we don't have to resend the entire file so let's talk about p2p connections you may be familiar with BitTorrent, uTorrent you may have used these um, PTP is known as peer-to-peer -peer, and it's used for file sharing now a lot of times people connect this with piracy it doesn't have to be for piracy you can download a uh, open source or freeware uh, programs, and that is completely legal. For example, you can download Linux operating system and use P2P, and that is completely legal. It's when you're doing copyright infringement that it becomes illegal. Now, we think of piracy and illegal sharing of files all the time. They're often used for legal file sharing. The Linux operating system, which I mentioned, because it's one person connecting to another, there is no protocol. There's no controlling mechanism. It's just peer to peer. The peers that are connected to one another act as both a client and a server, which means they act as a sender and receiver. Torrents, which are used in peer to peer, allow fast sharing of files because you can connect to multiple peers and download the pieces which are the packets you are missing rather than just from one server. This is often referred to as seeds and the seed health when running the torrent files. So when you're connecting to people, you are connecting to the seeds. Now, BitTorrent download speeds are based on how much you upload. Your download speed is affected by your sharing percentage, which is what makes you a server when people download what you have. So if you're using the application BitTorrent and you wanna have high download speeds, you also have to upload. You can't just download and log off BitTorrent. If you do that, they're gonna throttle uh, your download speed. So here's an example. This is from uh, the Pirate Bay, and the Pirate Bay does have some legal things on it. We see that this is the Linux operating system. We see that's what it is. It's an ISO file, which is an exact copy. So Chrome Operating System Linux is a brand new free operating system built around the revolutionary Google Chrome browser. So this right here is would be legal. It's perfectly legal. Now there are some problems and there are three basic problems to be solved if in systems want to use BitTorrent. How does a peer find others that have the wanted content? How do peers replicate content to provide high speed for everyone? And how do peers encourage other peers to provide content rather than just using the protocol to download for themselves? And the answer to this is where torrents were born and why they are used today for both legal and illegal content, primarily copyright infringement, not dark net or dark web content. For an example, this would be an example of illegal content. You can see there's lots of shows here. Lost, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, show. You have the 2016 reboot of MacGyver. You have the first five seasons of Supernatural. You can use to, uh, you know, any BitTorrent, uTorrent to download these, but it is illegal. It is illegal to do so. So each torrent file, whether it's legal or not, contains the name of a tracker. Now, each tracker is a server that contains a list of the chunks that make up the file and where the peer or user can get it. 
It contains a list of all the other peers, which we call the swarm, actively downloading and at the same time uploading the content. So if you have a piece you need from somebody, you're gonna to connect to them. So how do peers replicate content to provide high-speed downloads for everyone? Because you want it to be high-speed, and if you've downloaded a torrent, a legal one, because you would never do illegal, you know you get fast download speed. Well, the Swarm looks to download the rarest chunks first, the widely less available packet of data. Maybe one person has one packet. Well, we want to distribute that to as many people as possible so it becomes less rare. And now, rather than downloading that packet from one person, you can download it from multiple people. So each time it's downloaded, it is now less rare and more available for everyone. So how do peers encourage other peers to provide content rather than just using the protocol to download for themselves? So we call these leechers. They only download, and as soon as it is, as soon as it is downloaded, they shut down the torrent client. Now, BitTorrent seeks for peers who regularly upload to others, and then those peers can download. Those who only download will begin downloading slowly, then become isolated in what they call choked. So if you're downloading and then shutting down your client, we call those people leechers. So here's how it works. We have a list of peers here, and we can see everybody that's part of the swarm that we're currently downloading from. We can see our share ratio is zero. We have not shared anything. Um, and we have the source, which goes to the destination. And every user who downloads it is automatically uploading to the users. So this person is uploading it, and it works very, very well. Um, it overcomes. For example, you can see this person has four finished files. So they are actually seeding these. Whatever these files are, they are uploading to other people. They are currently downloading, and you can see they're getting 8.9 megabytes a second, which is pretty fast. We see these bars here, which is the seed health, which means we have many people seeding, many people we're connected to that are giving us the files that we need. Now, the following slides we're about done show the application layer protocols. So they are the applications that are used. For example, HTTP stands for the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. As part of the application layer, why does it exist? It's for the World Wide Web. It works for transmitting hypertext documents and web pages. It works on ports 80 and 80. 80. That's one application protocol. You can create your own web pages today and host files. And when you create your own web pages today, you, your people accessing it will use the HTTP, which is the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is how people access websites. That is the application layer. So here's a set of sample steps when accessing a web page. The Hypertext Transfer Protocol transmits a request message to the TCP. The TCP creates one or more packets and sends the first one to IP using port 80 for the destination port and a temporary port number for the sending port. IP uses the URL in the message to get an IP address from the domain name server and sends what we call a datagram. The IP forwards the datagram to the TCP. The TCP says, all right, I got it. It's sending the remaining packets, if any, to IP when a connection is established. It then forwards them through the server IP and TCP to the server application layer. The HTTP transmits a response message, which is transmitted by TCP, the IPs, and the TCP to the client browser application saying, hey, the web page is headed your way. So when you're downloading a web page or trying to visit a web page, all of this is happening, happening simultaneously, and it happens very quickly. And it all happens in one click through bookmarks or when you type in a web page. Here's another pro application protocol, SMTP, which stands for the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. What kind of mail are we talking about? We're talking about email. It's referred to as a push protocol. When you send an email, the email follows the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. It's going to push the email out. It's for sending email from one email client, client to a server. For example, going from Microsoft Outlook to Gmail, you can send an email to anybody, but because they all use the simple mail transfer protocol, it will work to go from one uh, client to another server. So if you're sending an email, it's gonna use the SMTP, the capability to relay messages from one server to another, 
is essential, especially if the users have two different email providers. But because those two different email providers use the same protocol, we are able to send email messages even when it's on, you know, from Gmail to AOL, from Outlook to Gmail or Outlook to whatever. That's why it can work. But that's to push emails out. When you're receiving emails, that's what we call the POP3, the post office protocol, and the three refers to version three. We re it retrieves email from an email server to an email client, so you're pulling emails off the server, and we call this a pool protocol. It pulls emails in, so it connects to the mail server through port 110, because each application needs a port. It retrieves the emails from the server and then it deletes them on the server because they're now on your computer. It then disconnects from the server and version three is widely used today because of the authentication tools that are required. When you log in to get your email, you must type in your username and password. You don't just go to some random website and find your, uh, your email, you have to log in. And that's why POP3 is used today because of the authentication uh, tools. Uh, let's be clear about number three, deletes them on the server. That if it, That is if you're not a public employee, for example, I'm a teacher. All my emails are kept on the server for five years. They're public record. Anybody can say, hey, I want to see the email this person sent, and they'll be able to see what I sent or what I responded to uh, because it is public record. They are not deleted off the server for five years. Now, your personal email, once you connect to the server, you're going to retrieve the email. Then they will be deleted because they're in your inbox. Um, you can also include attachments in emails. All right, FTP. This is it. Last one. File transfer protocol. You transfer files from one person to another. It allows files to be transferred to two connected computers where both are connected together to an FTP server address. They're both saying, hey, we're gonna use the file transfer protocol. Both computers connect, and it can allow this to happen where each user has a different operating system. So if you wanna send one file to somebody else, but there's two different operating systems, you can set up an FTP to do that. I hope you found this video helpful. A lot of information here. You really need to look it over. If you have any questions, you can always post a comment below. And we'll see you guys in the next video right after we read this last one. I forgot about this. FTPs overcome the problem of two computers connecting that have different operating systems, which we just talked about. That is going to be it. Please, if you have any questions, post a comment. We'll see you guys in the next one.